Texas, and welcome to the Liberty Mike Podcast, broadcasting from an undisclosed location in the heart of Dixie. I am Michael, and I'm here with Liberty Larry. How's it going? So, first thing I want to do today is uh, congratulate my cousin who had her baby yesterday. Ah. Um, so, congratulations, Katie. Way to go, I guess. Um, <laughs> hey, that's a lot of work, man. That's... Oh, no kidding. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, anyway, we're going to uh, memorialize the this uh, this moment here on the podcast for all and forever. I suppose yeah. the baby kind of does that too, but <laughs> you know. Wow. So I'm um, I'm feeling kind of celebratory today, and I, I got the good scotch out. Yeah, he did. <laughs> Gary doesn't like scotch. Though. Yeah, I'm not partaking in any, but I am watching Michael do so. It's ever, so good. Ever so celebratory. <laughs> yeah. Um. So uh, start with domestic stuff. Start with yeah other can, stuff. Where do you want to go? Doesn't matter to me. Um, I this mean, could can, be a bit of a potpourri of a podcast, by the way. We're, uh, <laughs> yeah, we got a lot of different things considered to talk about. So yeah, um, I mean, we can start start with the Virginia stuff. Okay. I mean, um, so looks like there's going to be a pro gun rally Monday over in Virginia, and um, there. <laughs> so the governor in I guess is afraid of what's going to happen or whatever. He has, um, he has, what would he say? Declared a state of emergency for the wow. state. Yeah. For the state of Virginia, or I guess not for the state, but for the, for the rally. So there, there will be searching people and there would be no guns allowed at the gun rally. So, well, I, which, um, I did hear that there was some kind of threat that they were going to try and, uh, take the Capitol or something. I don't know if there's well, any truth to that. There was some of that. And I guess they stopped some people that had a bunch of guns that were on their way up there. And there was worries of what they were going to do. I mean, I don't, I didn't really get a whole lot of solid information on some of that, but mm-hmm. there was, they, the, they claimed that they had credible threats of violence, which what worries me with a scenario like this to me, there's more chance of violence with nobody there having guns than there really is if everybody there has guns. To me, if everybody has guns, nobody's going to do anything well, because they know <laughs> everybody else there is armed. Um, that's true if you're a citizen, not if you're the government. Yeah, well, exactly. And that's, you know, maybe that's why the, um, the state of emergency is like a good idea because like they don't want them like to overtaking the Capitol or yeah. something. They, they got to worry about those, uh, fanatical Virginia militias, I suppose. Yeah. Um, well, they're, they're getting crazy pretty fanat- grun- gun toting, whatever. Well, I, I think even more than that, they're worried about people from outside the state because a lot, I've, I've seen a lot of talk on Facebook that people are seriously considering from out of state go into this thing just because they look at this as, well, if they can do it here, they can do it anywhere. Um, so uh, the, the, the war cry really is, is we got to stop it now here before other states start the same type thing. Yeah. Before people start, uh, believing that they actually have the right to carry and, and bear (laughs) arms, huh? Yeah. Well, um, I, the thing that I find most interesting about it is that they had, I I think that there was something like, this is the way I heard it reported is that there were about 5,000, uh, people who had said that they were going to be coming on Facebook. Yeah. And the state was concerned that they were going to have more than 100,000 people at this rally. And I thought, well, I think they're kind of blowing it up. And then I heard about that they were uh, banning guns at the gun rally. And I was like, well, that's a good way to get 100,000 people there. Oh, it absolutely Um, is. (laughs) um, You're creating the the problem that you're trying to prevent, (laughs) I think, um, by telling them that they don't have the right to carry there. Yeah. Yeah. So... Um, so I, I, well, where do you think it's going to go? I I mean, we'll see Monday. I mean, this may turn out to be like a nothing deal and it may mm-hmm. turn out to be a big thing. We'll just have to kind of wait and see. Yeah. Well, here's the other bit that I found interesting in the way the media was covering it, um, is that I heard on more than one occasion them, um, them citing Charlottesville, yeah. uh, in well, relation to this. In my reading yesterday, I saw that was more on more than one occasion that was brought up mm-hmm. Charlottesville, that we don't want this to be another Charlottesville. Yeah. You know? Um, I, I do find it interesting that the, the media and the government are equating anybody who wants to, uh, defend their, um, their personal liberties as a alt-right Nazi 
quadroon or whatever. <laughs> oh, so that was the other thing that was relevant that I wanted to talk about. I'm glad you said that. Is that the um? So the local local Antifa will be at this rally. Of course they will. Well, no, in support <laughs> of the gun people. Really? Like yes, they. Um, I was reading it last night. They were. They will be there, and they're in support. Now they didn't say. The, the one, the guy, the, I guess there's one guy I didn't catch. I've got his name. I, didn't, I don't remember offhand though. Um, that's like the local representative for the Antifa had said that um, he wouldn't say if there was going to be any violence or anything like that. If, if they're confronted by by far right guys or whatever, that there won't be any kind of violence against them. But they're there in support of gun rights, and he he said that flat out that they're there in support of this rally. Okay. Well, it's nice to know so. that they finally realized that the uh, the Nazis um, took away everybody's guns first. <laughs> right. <laughs> that this so. was an important part of a uh, um, as a, of an authoritarian uh, regime or takeover. Yeah. Uh, I mean, that's you got to do that first. That's step one. Yep. Well, so. interesting. Um, wow that that is that actually it, is it, really it, interesting. It adds, it adds a wrinkle to it for sure. So. Yeah, um, I well, I guess there are some people in Antifa that actually understand what they're they're doing because well, I had some doubts before. Well, and this guy had said he's like he, that that all of the way Antifa is set up or whatever is like different areas have different like they're just they're all independent, so mm -hmm. they're not like under one big umbrella, and they all kind of have different beliefs, you know, and that these guys are in support of the Second Amendment. So kind of like the Libertarian Party, huh? Kind of like the Libertarian <laughs> Party. It's not, you know, I thought about that when I was reading his little interview, his little quote from the interview. I was like, yeah, this kind of sounds kind of familiar. Not yeah. that I'm an Antifa guy, but you know, it it definitely there's some bleed over there as far as like. Like it's different all over the country, you know. Yeah. Just to be clear, I think I can speak for us both and say that uh, we are opposed to fascism. Oh yeah, yeah, <laughs> just a hair. Yeah, uh, I, I don't want anybody to get the wrong impression. Yeah, but yeah. hey, you know, I'll stand with I'll stand with people that I disagree with. If if we're if we're all going to stand up for one thing, like mm. as far as like whether it be anti-war or whether it be pro-gun, um, you know, we don't have to agree on everything. We we rally on things we agree with. Yeah, absolutely. You know. Absolutely. Um, I, you know, I often talk about the, uh, the train metaphor that, yeah. you know, as long as we're going on the same, in the same direction, we can ride in the same car whenever you're ready to get off. That's fine. Yeah. Um, and I, I'm going to try and talk you into getting back on, of course, and, and riding with me to the, the, uh, <laughs> anarchist end. But, yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, as long as, uh, as long as we're moving in the same direction, uh, we can ride together let's, as long as you'll, as you'll, uh, come along. Let's keep moving. Yeah. <laughs> Got to be so. nice and progressive. <laughs> oh, yeah. Is that right? <laughs> yeah. Hey, the ultimate progressives, right? Uh, maybe. Um, okay. Uh, this is a total non sequitur, so I'm, I'm just going to move on to another topic. To the, to the next thing. Um, yeah, because we got a list. Because I, I did uh, mention this last time that it was something that I wanted to talk about because it's not getting any coverage in, the, in major media. And um, as you'll recall, somewhere around March of... Uh, 2019, um, they released a report on the chemical weapons attack that occurred in Duma, uh, the alleged, I should say, chemical we weapons attack that occurred in Duma, Syria in uh, 2018, yeah. um, April 2018. And uh, as you'll recall, this was um, used as a pretext for the airstrikes by uh, the U.S., the U.K., and France uh, against the Syrian government. Yeah, I remember that. And we maintained at the time, um, I, I don't think we spent a lot of time talking about it because we missed the event. We just, we brought it up when the, um, the OPCW report came out. Yeah. And uh, we said at the time that it never made any sense to us that um, Assad would be responsible for chemical weapons attacks. He essentially won this war. And the last thing that you'd want to do is provide an excuse for the international community to come back in, get involved again. Of course, we never really left, but. Still, though. Yeah, point remains. And uh, so uh, I just wanted to bring up that over the last couple of months, give or take, um, there's been several uh, leaks um, that confirmed that there was at best uh, disagreement about the um, Organization for the Prevention of Chemical Weapons. That's OPCW for okay. those of you that don't know. Um, the OPCW's report on the incident um, from within the team and at worst, there was actually like conspiracy to uh, mislead the public um, 
on what actually happened there or what their findings would suggest. Yeah. Um, so there was a a story, um, by, uh, the counterpunch, uh, journalist, Jonathan Steele, um, that interviewed a, a whistleblower who said that the OPCW was visited by U S officials from, uh, an unknown U S agency in July, 2018. This was before the report came out. And, um, he wrote that the Americans told them emphatically that the Syrian regime had conducted a gas attack and that the two cylinders found on the roof and upper floor of the building contained 170 kilograms of chlorine. This was, you know, it like had to be included essentially. <laughs> yeah. like, this is what happened. This is what your report should say. Oh, now, wow. of course, this is just a, this is a whistleblower report. There's no real confirmation of it, yeah. but, um, these leaks, uh, while they don't, confirmed that particular incident with the U S um, agencies coming in and getting involved. Uh, there have been several, um, leaks related to some questions within the report. So, um, I'm, I'm going to try and summarize them okay. here as best I can. So, um, one of the big ones was that Ian Henderson's engineering assessment that the two cylinders presumably used for the delivery of the chlorine gas, um, were more likely manually placed than dropped from an aircraft, uh, you know, based on their condition, uh, where they were found, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. All right. So the OPCW chief of cabinet, Sebastian Braha, Breha, I, I don't know how to say his name. Anyway, um, he ordered the removal of that engineering assessment from the OPCW's document registry archive. Um, and then, uh, after this, um, and Henderson leaked the information, uh, later he leaked his report. Oh, really? and yeah. Um, and then they were claiming that, uh, the OPCW was claiming that Henderson had never been part of the fact finding mission. Um, but in these most recent leaks, uh, there's a internal email that says, uh, Ian Henderson was part of the FFM and there's an abundance of official documentation as well as other supporting proof that testifies to that. So oh. here's, you know, discrepancy one. Yeah. Yeah. Right. <laughs> we'll say. Yeah. Um, The uh, final report, the leaks also uh, say that the final report that was issued wasn't written by the team that went to Syria. Um, The the people that were actually on the ground uh, investigating this didn't really play a part in the final report that was produced. Um, And in fact, a lot of their information that they provided was ignored or omitted uh, really? from the report so it was written by people somewhere else oh, so basically other people came in and just like said what they wanted to, took the information and cherry picked it yeah exactly i mean the the big thing was that they um by choosing to include some information and not other information um they were biasing the report yeah and you know the question is whether it was done intentionally or not well, I don't think there's a whole lot of question there in my mind, but, yeah, you know, I, call me a conspiracy theorist. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I don't, I think the tinfoil hat fits, but I, you know, yeah. I can't say for sure. Um, uh, the next thing is that the uh, the team that attended a meeting on the symptoms displayed by the alleged victims in Duma um, all agreed that, uh, quote, that the key takeaway message from the meeting was that the symptoms observed were inconsistent with exposure to chlorine and no other obvious candidate chemical causing the symptoms could be identified, end quote. Um, The unpublished interim report, uh, which was also later leaked, um, said that some of the signs and symptoms described by witnesses and noted in photos and video recordings taken by witnesses of the alleged victims are not consistent with exposure to chlorine containing choking or blood agents such as chlorine gas, phosgene, or cyanogen chloride. But yeah. <laughs> um, the final report that was released uh, says that symptoms of the uh, alleged victims, as described by witnesses and observed in open sourced videos, indicate exposure to an inhalant, irritant, or toxic substance. And it also said uh, it's currently not possible to precisely link the cause of the signs and symptoms to a specific chemical. Um, so they at least made some question, but by choosing to leave out the part that that these experts yeah. said that there was no indication that it was related to chlorine, um, suggests that with the other information that was included in the report that it was. Really? Right. Um, yeah. And then I, I know this may be kind of dull, but I think this is important because 
Yeah. Like we use this kind of information to start wars. Well, I was going to say, I mean, <laughs> we shot a bunch of missiles off over exactly this. Yeah. I mean, you know, I mean, it, it, it's important. You Trump's know. presidential moment. <laughs> yeah, that, he never looked more presidential. Right. <laughs> That's a quote from somebody. I don't remember who it was. I, I think it was. At the, at the time. Though. I think it was Don Lemon or somebody. It may was, have been Don Lemon. Uh, one, anyway. of, one of those lefties said that. <laughs> yeah. Never been more presidential. <laughs> Um, the report also said that they had sufficient evidence to determine that the chlorine was likely released from the cylinders, uh, but the samples they analyzed um, were in contact with a chemical that contained a chlorine atom, which could have been a number of chemicals. And um, the there was a, a leak of an email where a person on the team was saying um, that purposely singling one of... Um, one of chlorine gas as one of the possibilities is disingenuous really? that it could have been any number of things. And to, to say that it, uh, to single out chlorine ja- gas was yeah. so obviously intended to lead you in a direction that may or may not be true. Yeah. And, and leading in that direction. So what do we think really may have happened here? I mean, does it look like maybe the rebels did this on their own to try to draw in the U S or some other group? Yes, uh, that I mean that was our position at the time. Uh, it was, and, I remember. So, um, so this is evidence towards that. Y- yes, um, some of it is evidence towards that, like the yeah. uh, engineering report that says that the canisters were placed yeah. in position. That would suggest that it was a local group um, that was setting up a red flag incident to, or a false flag incident to um, to draw in international support. Yeah, that were fighting on their side for the most part, but had had left. The conflict, yeah. more or less. Because, I mean, at, at the point this happened, I mean, Syria pretty well had it in the bag. Or I say Syria, but Assad pretty well had it in the bag. Yes. So, I mean, it didn't, because we said that at the time. It's like, the timing of this makes no sense. Mm-hmm. Like, I mean, it, at least as far as it being Assad. Yeah. You know, the evidence at the time we had said looked more like this was, you know, people on the ground. Yeah, it wouldn't make sense for Assad to do it. It would make sense for the uh, the rebels, mm-hmm. um, the Sunni jihadists that were the rebels, um, to do this to try and draw the U.S. back in. This was like yeah. right after the U.S. had announced that they were leaving the conflict. Exactly. Um, and it wouldn't make any sense for uh, Assad to risk drawing the U.S. back in by doing something like this, especially when he had it in the back. Exactly. Um, and so the, the last major item that I... I pulled out of these uh, the reports on these leaks um, is that the uh, the final report said that there were uh, high levels of various chlorinated organic derivatives uh, detected in environmental samples, but one of the leaked emails said that the uh, that describing those levels as high likely overstates the extent of levels of chlorinated organic derivatives detected. They were in most cases present only in parts per billion range as low as one to two parts per billion, which is essentially trace quantities. And that if they'd wanted to do it properly, they should have taken more environmental samples to try and prove that what they found there was, uh, was higher than background. Yeah. Um, and that they did not do that. Yeah. Or they left that information out. One of the two. (laughs) Intentionally. Yeah. yeah. So, um, so those are the big things. And, um, I, I just wanted to remind people that much like this Iran Iraq thing that's going on right now, um, the reason that we were even involved in Syria is because because of the redirection after we had discovered or realized or whatever that we had just uh, essentially fought a war for Iran in Iraq. Yeah. And we couldn't, you know, we couldn't start that war again, but on the other side, because that would make it clear how stupid the people in, at the, that were making these decisions were. Water, <laughs> yeah. Right. Um, so instead, uh, they redirected their efforts into Syria to try and overthrow Assad because he was an Iranian ally. Yeah. Um, but what that meant was that the U.S. was supporting uh, the um, Jabhat al-Nusra, or the al-Nusra Front, or also known as al-Qaeda in Syria. This is the al-Qaeda group in Syria. It's the Sunni jihadists in Syria. These were the moderate rebels <laughs> that we were supposedly um, supporting in Syria. Yeah. In, and we've talked about it before, but anytime you use the term moderate rebel, yeah. that, that term doesn't really float well. <laughs> yeah, I, and uh, um, I think in one of the articles I wrote, I said exactly that. I was like, yeah. at whatever point you've decided to take up arms, you are yeah. no longer moderate. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I mean, uh, like, that's that's a pretty extreme oh. uh, decision to make that you would uh, be willing to sacrifice your life and take somebody else's. Not moderate that's anymore. That's not moderate, yeah. yeah. But people need to listen out for that when they're listening to the main 
mainstream media, you know what I mean? That's that's definitely a term that you can look for is like, all right, maybe something isn't be as is isn't as presented here, you know. <laughs> right. Right, exactly. Um and I do want to so I think I'd like to uh to dive into this in greater detail in a future podcast uh, okay. because I I find this fascinating, although I think this is kind of an like an esoteric interest. Yeah. Um, so maybe most people won't find it as fascinating as I do, but, um, but maybe if I had, you know, a lot more information to pre- present to you, you would. Um, I was talking with somebody the other day about like how the Middle East, and this applies to Africa in a lot of ways too, um, which are, you know, two of the most unstable areas in the world. Yeah. Um, but that the uh, the national lines drawn in these places weren't drawn by the people there. They were drawn by the European powers, uh, the c- colonial powers, um, yeah. that were dividing up these areas to, that they were going to dominate um, yeah. and making decisions, you know, drawing lines saying, okay, uh, UK gets this part and France gets this part and, you know, like that. Yeah. Um, and uh, and so all these these national lines in these places were drawn without any regard to uh, history or um, ethnic background or religious affiliation or anything yeah, else. Or they the were people just, living there, you know. Yeah, they were just goes lines to one of on our the ground. You know? I mean, they could have drawn these lines right through the center of villages. It, yeah. it didn't matter. It was just yeah. a, a, a an area just that they the, were claiming. Just them um, dividing it up, right? Um, and so what I find really fascinating about this is how somehow these, these lines have been reified, that this kind of abstract idea of where these boundaries exist has now become something that people take so seriously that they fight over. Them. Yeah. Wow. And, and they fight over them to maintain those lines <laughs> um, yeah. that were just made up in the first place. Yeah. And, uh, and I just, I think that's, I don't, I don't understand exactly how this happens. Yeah. Um, it's like you created a thing out of nothing and now it matters to people. I mean, and you know, and I could draw a parallel, I think there to like uh, the dollar. Yeah. Right. It's the same kind of idea. Like you've got this piece of paper, which is supposed to represent something. Um, and, uh, whether it does or not, people accept it as representing something and then they value it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I don't know. (laughs) So it's interesting thought. Yeah. I mean, it's just something to think about. I've been thinking about this quite a bit over the last few days, maybe it's the anthropology background. So I'm like starting to ask myself what it is that changes in people's minds that, you know, where they drew their own lines between villages or, you know, sects or whatever, um, now has, now doesn't matter. It's the lines that the Europeans came, Europeans (laughs) came in and drew, uh, that they just made up out of, out of thin air or convenience or whatever. Time would have something to do with that though. I mean, it's been this way for like how long now? Uh, 70 ish years. Yeah. Um, Maybe it's maybe not that more. long. I mean, that's. I mean, you figure seventy years. I mean, that's less than, you know. I mean, that's like one like lifetime. I guess less yeah. than one lifetime. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, seems seems like you're right. It seems like they would want to go back to what their original lines and areas were. Yeah, and well, and because, this is one because of the things it would be in memory. Yeah, or at least the most people. Mm-hmm. And it doesn't even need to be. Uh, I mean, this is why we promote self government. Um, like I'm all for secessions, all, all kinds of secession. Yeah. So you divide yourself into whatever group you think that you can maintain and that people will get along in. Yeah. At however large or small that might be. Um, and, um, my experience suggests that the smaller the group, the easier it is to do that. To manage. Yeah. yeah. Um, to find a group of people that have similar enough ideas about the way things should be done that they all can get along together. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, but particularly by drawing these lines without any regard to any of that stuff has created conflict. Yeah. Um, I mean, I mean it, definitely been cl- conflict there for the past 70 years. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, there's no question about that. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, um, and so, uh, anyway, uh, we'll probably have a future podcast where I just give a lot more historical detail about yeah. that. You it, know. It, that could be fun to go in some depth on, you mm-hmm. know, kind of how these lines were originally and kind of what, how they were drawn now and why. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So. Um, I suppose that we need to talk about impeachment to we, some degree. We I, might as well go. <laughs> like I say, there's, I, like I had mentioned before the podcast, as far as I've seen, there's not that much going on there. Um, you know, I know they sworn in all the senators yesterday. Well, I guess 
I guess Pelosi took the the articles over yesterday or the day before. And so yesterday, I know yesterday that they were swearing in all the senators and getting them all sworn in. Um, I did hear that there was some talk, and I don't think anything will come of it, that the ones that are running for president should recuse themselves. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, and, and I think there's probably a strong argument to be made for that. And honestly, I bet if you ask them candidly, they'd probably rather do that. They would much rather be campaigning right now exactly. than be in the Senate. That's the real reason. And- but they can't do that because mm-hmm. it'll it'll look to that they won't be doing their part if they leave. Mm-hmm. But I mean, I bet if you asked them candidly, they'd absolutely tell you, yeah, I'd, I'd much rather be campaigning. Yeah. Well, and somebody brought up to me today, um, what does somebody like Doug Jones do? Uh, so oh, Doug for those Jones of you is screwed, th- by the way. Yeah. Um, <laughs> this is it, a no win for him. Yeah. So uh, for those of you out there, Doug Jones is the uh, the only Democrat senator in Alabama and for a, a while. For a long time, now. yeah. And the reason that he won is he barely won the contest over um, accused pedophile Judge Roy Moore. Yes. Like, so <laughs> the, uh, the Republican that was an accused pedophile... Almost, almost still beat. won this election. <laughs> yes, he almost did. Um, we're uh, on we, the we whole in this We discussed this state. on the podcast yeah. at the time, so yeah. if anybody wants to go back. <laughs> <laughs> on the whole in the state, we are not real Democrat f- friendly. No. Um, I mean, there are pockets, there are representatives that are uh, well, yeah, Democrat. There's, but there's areas, just like there is anywhere. Mm-hmm. But, but when you get the whole state voting... Yeah, um, you can throw it out the window. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, <laughs> and we were talking about, well, what does he do? Well... I mean, he he certainly can't vote yes for impeachment, not in this state. There's way too many Trump supporters. That'll yeah. definitely lose him the next election. Oh, yeah. Um, does he vote present? Yeah. That doesn't gain him anything. No. Uh, he can't. I don't think he can really abstain or vote present. I think that yeah. most likely he will vote present. Yeah. Um, but that's that doesn't help him. Yeah. Um, at all, uh, he loses the election then too. Yeah. Um, so if he votes no, if he votes against impeachment, that's his best chance, right? Yeah. Is to say, no, look, I'm, I'm the moderate Democrat. I'm maintaining the line. I'm not sticking with the party line. Um, I'm voting with the people that I represent and I'm voting no for impeachment. That's his only chance. But even then I think his road to reelection is tough. Yeah. Well, then he's got to face Sessions who will almost certainly win somehow oh. again. Um, wow. And uh, Bradley you think is, is Sessions running? Has he announced? I think so. I, I, I could be wrong about that. I, may, I don't. I haven't seen where he's announced. Now I think he's going to. I've heard that he's going to, but I don't know if he officially has. Yeah, I don't. If I well, don't I'll, t- I'll tell you this. Just my knowledge of the state. If if he runs, he wins. I don't see any reason, any way. Ses- I see reason. <laughs> I don't see any way though that Ses- Sessions loses. But no, yeah. I agree. Um, the question was posed to us. What is the libertarian position here on Trump's impeachment? Yeah. And this is kind of this is kind of difficult to answer because there's a bunch of different. Answers. First off, there's no libertarian position yeah. on it. I mean, exactly. we're, like we want to dissolve all of this. Yeah. <laughs> like, that's that's our position <laughs> officially. <laughs> um, I think that if uh, if he if there's proof that he did what they claim, yeah. which is to explicitly use his power as the president to try and find or to create, to influence somebody to create negative information about a possible um, opponent, then he should be impeached. Yeah. And I think the libertarians would stand by that. Problem is, is they ain't really presented much convincing evidence of that. Yeah. There's a whole lot of hearsay and speculation. And even with yeah. this, these new revelations that have popped up, it's yeah. still hearsay and speculation. It's it's nothing nothing solid. And the thing is, you're not going to get anything solid on this. I don't think no. the Democrats know that. No, um, they're hoping that you know just swirling this around will be enough. Mm-hmm. But now, I, I do find it interesting that the issue here um, is that he threatened to not give weapons. <laughs> or money, really. It was money to buy money weapons to buy from weapons. us. Yeah. Um, that Obama refused to provide. Yeah. Uh, like he wouldn't give lethal support to the Ukrainians. Now, um, Trump is being impeached for refusing to give lethal support to the Ukrainians, <laughs> even though the last president also refused to give lethal support to the Ukrainians. Yeah. Um, 
but I guess he didn't ask for anything in return. And that's just a lie anyway. Uh, yeah. Like everything that is that is offered by the U.S. to anybody has caveats. Well, it's all it's all a horse trade. I mean, yeah. it's, you know, want something for something, you know. Mm -hmm. I mean, we don't just go around giving away money. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, we do, but I mean, we want well, stuff in return for it. Well, but it's it's a way of privatizing public funds again. Yeah. I mean, this is a this is a really good example of that and it happens all the time. This isn't the this isn't an isolated example of um, taking public funds, giving it to another country on the condition that they spend it here. Yeah. Um, so it's a way of, uh, of moving your tax, mo tax dollars into, uh, Northrop Grumman or, um, Raytheon or whoever, actually in this case, I think it was Raytheon and, uh, the one that I always think of as a plane company that I can't ever remember Boeing? the name. No, no, no. Um, <laughs> the other one, uh, the Lockheed other one. Martin. Oh, Lockheed Martin. Okay. Yeah. Um, so it, it's a way of, of using your tax dollars to, uh, to generate revenue for these companies. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I wish that we would start impeaching presidents for this. They, yeah. Like we wouldn't have a president last 60 days. <laughs> right. Not, well, I don't know. I think you impeach a couple and then everybody starts like, oh, we can't do this anymore. <laughs> well, maybe. This isn't the game anymore. <laughs> we got to be quieter but, about it is what it would become. Well, yeah. Um, and I think that there's plenty of reason to, uh, to impeach Trump. I think this is okay. So I think that this is the general libertarian line on this, that there's plenty of reasons to impeach Trump that are good, legitimate state reasons to impeach Trump. Yeah. Why don't we use one of them? Yeah. Well, I'll tell you why. Because if you do that, then you have to go back and take a look at all of the presidents prior. Yeah. And and nobody's willing to do that. Um because because we I think we may have talked about it on this podcast, but it's the difference between crimes of the state and yeah. You know, yeah, yeah. We we've talked about this several times, actually. So, uh, which is why, which is why in my notes um, on topics that we could discuss, it says impeachment. I guess. I guess, yeah. <laughs> like so. I'm resigned that I that I have to talk about this, but I don't really want to. This is yeah. well, like I say, it's it's all in the media. There's there's a bunch going on. I haven't heard anything today, but I know as of yesterday where they were at, they were swearing in the senators, mm -hmm. and and that was. The big talk I heard was kind of the debate whether or not the the ones running for president should recuse themselves. Yeah, um, and that's that's kind of you know where things are at with it. Well, that's totally uninteresting. Well, you know, I mean, it is what it is. <laughs> well, speaking of crimes of the state, okay, this, this is our our first good transition oh, here nice. in this entire podcast. Um, another thing, and this I think this will only take a few minutes, is that I wanted to talk about this idea of uh, the um, Iranian general. Uh, Qasem Soleimani as a terrorist. Okay. All right. Um, so I am not like, I'm not okay. Uh, okay. Let's, hmm. how, how, do do you... I, how do I state this? <laughs> um, all right. I am not opposed to naming a state military leaders and state military groups as terrorists. Um, there's problems with that though. Yes. <laughs> There's obvious problems with that. <laughs> now my position is that if you're going to do that, you got to do it all the way around. Exactly. And so what would that then mean for the U S military? It's a problem. Right? <laughs> it's a serious problem. Um, and I, I would say, uh, to, there are a few out there. You can read accounts from people that live in some of these countries like Afghanistan, um, which I think is the most drone bombed country in the world. Um, yeah. read accounts from people that live in these countries where we're operating a drone war and, uh, and they're, you know, their description of how it is to live and, you know, hear the drones flying overhead and to wonder at any moment if there's going to be a bomb dropped on you and to live your every day of your life that way. Yeah. And um, ask yourself if you don't agree that that is terrifying. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Um, that, that that's a terror act in and of itself. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, you know, then, of course, we've brought up the issue of signature strikes. Yeah. Uh, so it's based on behavior or movements or anything that seems, um, Fishy. out of the ordinary. Yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, suspicious in any way. Um, so, you know, the movement of a vehicle that appears to be uh, counter surveillance stuff where, you know, I gave the example before that this would qualify as something worthy of drone bombing, um, in some of these areas. If I'm on my way to work yeah. and I think I've left my cell phone, <laughs> at home. And so I turn around, do a Yui, start heading back home. 
um, go down the road a little bit. And then I realized that, nope, the phone just fell between the seats. And then I pull over to the side of the road and stop for a minute while I dig my cell phone out from beneath the seats. And then I turn back around and start heading the way that I was going. I mean, that's a, a, a similar kind of move that you would do if you were, if you were working counter surveillance where you're trying to see if anybody was following you, um, you would do the same thing. And so this can be something that qualifies as a behavioral signature that would earn you a drone strike. (laughs) Don't get lost. Right. And so a lot of these, uh, these operations with the drones, um, and I think like I would say U S military operations in general in this part of the world, um, they operate without regard to civilians at all. Yeah. Um, the, in fact, just like a week or so ago, there was a report from Afghanistan that a U.S. strike um, killed 30 plus, 30, 35 Taliban fighters. Okay. Well, yeah. you know, I'm, even that's kind of questionable to me. But all right, 30 to 35 Taliban fighters. But they also killed like 65 or so civilians, including women and children. Wow. See, that's just insanity, man. That's just oh, it's so horrible. So now, given that information, assuming that it's true, yeah. uh, are the people that ordered that strike now terrorists? I mean, they are in my mind. I mean, I don't see how you can look at it any other way. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's just, that's so horrible. Yeah. And it's not earning us friends. No. Uh, <laughs> well, and that's just it. I mean, that's you figure every one of those civilians that was killed, their families are now likely to become you know, jihadist or whatever. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're just, you're creating more jihadists every time you do something like that. Right. Because I'll tell you, I mean, if something like that happened to my family and all of a sudden I've got nothing else to live for because my family was killed by a drone bomb, Mm -hmm. I'm going after who it was. You live for revenge. Yeah. Now I have a (laughs) purpose that my purpose is revenge now. Like, I mean, you know what? I mean, I'm not just going to go about my life. Yeah. Well, and, um, you know, the at the time of 9-11, uh, Al-Qaeda was like 400 guys, um, mostly in the Middle East, but scattered across North Africa and the Middle East. Yeah. Um, and now it's, what, 40,000? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, exactly. We have not made the world a safer place in, in uh, prosecution of this terror war. No, no. Not for Americans or anybody else? Not for anybody. Absolutely. Just ask France. <laughs> right. Mm-hmm. Um, and speaking of France, see, I'm, I'm getting oh, better we're, at this. We're, yeah. we're, we're transitioning all <laughs> over the place now. <laughs> um, this is probably the last topic uh, tonight. Um, we're trying to keep these things short. We're still like, we tend we tended to drone, drone on. Drone on. Oh, <laughs> nice. Uh, so, <laughs> no, it's getting terrible now. You see, <laughs> yeah, we got to wrap it up. Um, so I, I did want to mention this because I just think this is so funny. Um, so there's been uh, protests in France uh, for the last six weeks, give or take, okay. um, about uh, their Macron's attempts to uh, introduce pension reform. Ah, they're, so they're doing that again. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so um, they have like 40 plus different pension systems. They're trying to bring it down to a single pension system that applies to everybody. Um, and do it in a way that would uh, preserve some money because the state just doesn't have the money to maintain the pension system as it is. And this included um, uh, them raising the retirement age to get full benefits. Now you'd still get benefits if you retire before this age, but to get full benefits um, uh, from the pension, uh, they would raise the retirement age from 62 to 64. (laughs) Two years. Yeah. Um, And people went ballistic. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and and just what's the retirement age here in the U.S.? Oh, I have no clue. I'm pretty sure it's sixty-five. It may be sixty-five. <laughs> I know I've got my four hundred one k set up for sixty-five, so yeah. I'm sixty-five. Here we go. <laughs> yeah. So the the French already have a four day work week, retire at sixty-two, um, get full benefits from the state, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. All right. So they're trying to make some minor changes to this, yeah. um, and bring them all under a single system that applies to everybody. And uh, this is also bearing in mind that. F- France has one of the largest public sectors in the developed world. Like the, yeah. there's I, I, something like a third of their population works for the state or something like oh, that. Wow. Yeah. Um, and, uh, 
<laughs> this so. is so what has happened now is that like well their transportation sector kind of shut down um, for the holidays, which drove people crazy, obviously. Yeah. Um, and uh, there are some groups that are on board and some groups that aren't. And everybody agrees that the pension system needs to be reformed, but nobody can agree on how they want to do it. And so in this particular case, uh, as the government tries to negotiate with all these groups about how to fix the pension system, um, how to reform it and still meet everybody's demands, like... All of these different groups, all these industries and occupations are claiming that they deserve some kind of special treatment. Of so, course they do. <laughs> like yeah. air traffic controllers have the most stressful job in the world, and so they shouldn't have to, you know, retire so late. They should be able to retire earlier. And dock workers have to um, handle uh, dangerous chemicals all the time, and so they shouldn't have to retire so late, and they should get a higher benefit um, in the end, uh, you know, a higher health benefit in the end. And, um, you know, teachers, I, who knows? I yeah. mean, everybody's it, it goes got on their and thing. On and on. Yeah. <laughs> right in the medical field and blah 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 like everybody wants their own thing and so i'm looking at this and watching them try and make all these agreements with these various groups and it seems to me that in order to settle uh, these disputes and pass uh, an actual reform to the pension system that they may actually end up with more pension systems than they started with and that it may even cost more it and the whole point of more. this was to bring it down to one and have it cost less and they may end up with more that costs more. That's insanity. That's your government for you. I'll tell you so though something to kind of drive this home. So we've talked on the podcast before about um how like what what could happen to like really get people upset about these wars and whatnot. Mm -hmm. But this just goes to show you when you do something that affects the individual. So like that's the example you gave. All of these are individual groups and they're all in the streets protesting over this deal because it affects them personally. Yeah. And that's the difference. The deal with the wars, it's all it's far away. Nobody understands it. But you start messing with people's pocketbook, it it makes an effect. Yeah. Well, here's the the issue as I see it. Um, and it's the same problem that you have with any kind of entitlement program anywhere. Um, is that everybody thinks that benefits need to be reduced? Yeah, for everybody but them. But the per but the ones that they're involved in. Right. Yep. Um, so you know, all the other professions, their benefits need to be reduced. But the profession that the that the ego is in. Yep. Their benefits need to be increased because they're special in some way. Exactly. So yeah, you. Uh, it's it's. Uh, it, I mean, it's not a strange phenomenon. It makes perfect sense when mm -hmm. you think about it, but. You know, it's just one of those things. Yeah. And this so. is also why I think that, um, you know, uh, Bernie and Elizabeth Warren and Andrew Yang and all these people that get up there and talk about all these things that they're going to give you for free, um, that first off, it won't work. Yeah. Uh, but secondly, and I, I think this is really important. I, I think that it's, for whatever reason, it's not looked at, it the, looked at in this way. But these are bribes. These yeah. are bribes for votes. Just buying votes. Yep. Yeah, you want to talk about election interference. Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> um, hey, all of you that are between 18 and 25 that don't vote in election after election after election, if you vote in this election and you vote for me, I'm going to forgive all your student loans. Yep, yep. And all I'm right. going to give you a guaranteed job. <laughs> right. And, yeah. So. And on and on and on. We're going to raise the min minimum wage to $20 an hour. Yeah, Andrew 15. Yang, everybody that gets me elected, all of you will get $1,000 a month Yeah, for right? nothing. For nothing, yeah. 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 Right. UBI. No, it, it really is insanity, but mm. it's it's kind of the way it is right now, you know? Yeah. But there's got to be a better way. Yeah, and and I think that we have the answer. Yeah, and the answer is stop taking people's money away. I, I got a uh, speaking of Doug Jones earlier. Yeah. Um, I got his newsletter recently um, that you know talked about how hard he'd worked in the last year and how hard he's going to be working in this next year to ensure that as many of our tax dollars as he as he can get come back to Alabama. Yeah. And I was like, well, why don't you just skip the middleman and keep him from taking it from us in the first place? Yeah, like that's a campaign slogan. Right <laughs> yeah, <there. laughs> exactly. Put that on a bumper sticker. <laughs> <laughs> you you won't pay federal taxes anymore. We'll just keep that money here. We'll oh, keep yeah. It, yeah. I'll vote for you for um, that. Absolutely. Um, that's a step in the right direction. We're, we're, on the, we're on the same train that way. Yeah, yeah. right. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, the 
the answer is to let people make their own decisions about their lives and, and suffer the consequences as necessary. Yeah. And then if things go badly for them, put them in a position where instead of using the power of the state to extort money from the people around them, they have to go hat in hand to their neighbors, their community and, and say what they need. Yeah. And there are plenty of people that'll help. Oh, absolutely. Um, there always are, but at least it's handled at the local level. So people know what you've done to put yourself in this position and they'll be a little bit more careful about what they give out to people that are just going to throw it away. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. But nobody That's, wants anybody to starve. No, absolutely not. And, you know, before all these benefits, people weren't starving. No, there was. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Um, so uh, anyway, uh, I guess that's as good a place as any to wrap up. We have all the answers. All you got to do is let people make their own choices about their lives. Um, personal liberty is the answer to all life's problems. Agreed. <laughs> well, personal liberty and whiskey. And whiskey. Ooh, yeah. Got to have that too. Yeah. <laughs> Um, all right. So, uh, with that, oh, uh, by the way, um, I did have an article published at antiwar.com uh, today. Um, so go check it out Woo-hoo. there. Yeah. I'm, I'm actually pretty excited about that. Yeah. One. It's awesome. And, um, and it was picked up at the future of freedom foundation too, which is also exciting, uh, because that organization is run by Jacob Hornberger, who's ah. running for president, as you'll recall. Yes. I might have yes. to give him more money, <laughs> but right. I swear it's not a bribe, but it's no bribe. <laughs> Oh, it's going um, viral, man. That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and um, so we're, we did, we are a day late. Apologize. I wasn't going to mention anything, but yeah. Yeah, most people probably wouldn't even notice. Yeah. <laughs> but we are a day late. But we're going to try and be back here on Thursday again. Of course, you know, sometimes things get in the way. Yeah, life happens, and, uh, man. It, I'll say it was mostly my fault. I'm the one that sent the text yesterday and said, um, can, can we do this? tomorrow <laughs> yeah and i i just i didn't push you for not for not for doing it immediately i was yeah. like no extra that'd be nice actually yeah <laughs> so. well good we're in agreement yep um so the plan is uh to uh for to have everybody um follow us on facebook uh yeah actually follow the page I yep. think I think we just got over a hundred followers or something like that on the Facebook page. That I seems nice. Let's looked, let's push yeah. for a thousand now. <laughs> All right. Um, <laughs> Next milestone. Yeah. Um, so uh, follow us on on Facebook. Um, where else? Oh, uh, subscribe on iTunes or Podbean, uh, where you can find the podcasts. Um, you can always check out our website at the Liberty Mike dot com. Um, anything interesting that comes up will be posted there. So there's a whole podcast page. And then, of course, there's the front page where anytime I get an article published somewhere, um, I link it there. Uh, also, if I don't get an article published somewhere, then I will publish it there. No, nah, Yep. Yep. Uh, so um, there's that, too. So. Plenty of benefits to visiting the Liberty Mike dot com. Absolutely. And uh, we'll probably be making some changes to that page soon. I hope I'm I'm trying to figure out uh, a little bit more about the HTML and so forth to make it even prettier than it already is. And it looks pretty nice right now, I think. Actually, I think it looks pretty good, but always room for improvement. Uh, Yeah, always. Um, So, yeah, follow us everywhere. Like and share. Mm -hmm. Uh, Shares help. Um, Reviews on iTunes or Podbean. Those are always nice, too. Comments and and reviews. And um, we will be back in a week when we finally get this right. And in the meantime, try and stay free. Train how you fight. Ciao. Later.